really, to be honest, I don't, I don't see it as uh, arrogant in the least or even impertinent because the truth of the matter is uh, for 2,000 years, people have been making arguments one way or the other for the eternity of hell. I think manifestly when you look at them, and I, I try to do the, what justice I can in, in the short space of the book, they obviously don't work. There's obviously something amiss somewhere along the line in the tradition we have taken uh, on board beliefs that are incompatible with one another. And there has never been a point at which universalism was utterly absent from Christian tradition. It was a perfectly honorable view in the early church, uh, in the early centuries of the church. And there has always remained a stream of universalism, especially in the East, that has gone at times somewhat dormant and at other times been more uh, uh, vigorous. 19th century Russia, it's very hard to find a serious Orthodox thinker who doesn't just presume mm. universalism. It's, it's like, you know, when you read Dostoevsky, for instance, mm-hmm. Ivan's entire argument about what, you know, his, his entire problem with God is not heaven and hell. He mm-hmm. assumes that everyone's going to be saved. It's that he doesn't think the price for the eternal beatitude of all creatures should have had to be paid, mm-hmm. you know, the suffering of a little girl. And that's what makes it a powerful argument. It's yeah. not. It's not. A, it's not an argument that says, "Well, if only everything ended up happily, then then God would be let off the hook." It's an argument that even with a happy ending, perhaps the moral story seems incomprehensible. It's the you alternative know, to the prose ending of Job. That's right. In consequence, it, it's always been part of the tradition, but the majority tradition, it seems to me, is something that. That you take, I mean, if you, if you examine it seriously, setting aside your presupposition that it must be true, and consider all the traditional arguments from every angle, you find that, that the logic sustaining every single one of them dissolves in your hands. And then, once you've freed yourself, perhaps, of the illusion that, that you must believe this thing, and you go back to the text and you look at, say, 1 Corinthians 15, and try to imagine seeing it through the eyes of, say, Gregory of Nyssa, you realize that that a very different story is being told than the one that you got in Sunday school. 